Today we'll speak on PGT. PGT is pre-implantation genetic testing. It's a procedure that helps us know if the oocyte or the polar body or the embryo is normal or not. Over a period of time, PGT has undergone remarkable change. Somewhere in the 1978, the first IVF baby was born. And after that, trying to avoid an abnormal implantation or an abnormal embryo getting implanted in an IVF, they began a search to know which embryo is normal. Say, if we have like 8 to 10 embryos for a couple, then knowing which embryo is normal and has a good potential for implantation will help remarkably in achieving a successful implantation, will help in preventing a miscarriage and so on and so forth. And also, if there is a heritable genetic disorder in the family, say either one of the parents suffering from a genetic disorder or if somebody in the family is suffering from a genetic disorder and parents are carriers of those genetic disorder, PGT helps in identifying which embryos do not carry the same disorder so that it helps us select the best embryo for transfer. So this way we can prevent the genetic disorder passing on from generation to generation. Now in PGTA we have like three types of tests. One is called PGTA that is pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. The second one is PGTM wherein it stands for pre-implantation genetic testing for a monogenic disorder and then we have PGTSR that is pre-implantation genetic testing for structural rearrangements. Now these three different kinds of tests are for three different kind of abnormalities but however the principle of the whole testing remains the same which means it entails a certain things prior to going ahead with PGTA. It involves an IVF. Now IVF because we need to have embryos to check whether they have a problem. What does that include? So if there is an indication for testing the first thing is to, is to have a genetic counseling. So basically, it's a multidisciplinary approach wherein you need a geneticist, you need a counselor and you need a reproductive medicine person who actually can plan out the whole cycle. It starts off first with a counseling wherein the geneticist actually plans how the genetic testing on the embryo is going to go forward depending on which type of test is being planned for. So and then the reproductive medicine specialist will plan for the IVF wherein the stimulation that is the pre-IVF tests are done and then the stimulation of the women for producing more number of eggs will start which will entail about 8 to 10 days of injections. Post that the lady undergoes an egg collection procedure and then we fertilize the eggs with the husband's sperm, culture the embryos and then plan for an embryo biopsy. There was a time when embryo biopsy used to be done on a cleavage stage embryo say about a decade ago but however now we culture the embryo still blastocyst stage that is still the day 5 stage when the embryo itself has formed a 100 to 150 cell structure and take about 5 to 10 cells from the trophectoderm. See, principally blastocyst has two parts. One is called the inner cell mass that forms the baby. And then there's a trophectoderm that helps in implantation of the embryo into the uterus. Now this trophectoderm, taking a couple of cells from the trophectoderm is not going to harm the embryo. So this is the basic principle. So by taking a few cells, the embryo is not harmed. Once we take these cells, if we can test and know what kind of cells they are, then it will help us identify one, whether the embryo is normal. At the same time, it's not going to harm the embryo's implantation potential. So in the blastocyst stage, when the embryo is about 100 to 150 cell size, we do something called as laser resisted hatching. Make a small nick away from the inner cell mass and then take about 5 to 10 cells for testing. So once these cells are removed by embryo biopsy, which is a highly skilled procedure, technically challenging. So very few labs offer this test because of the complexity associated around the testing. Once these cells are aspirated, they are tube. They are put in, it's called as tubing. So once they're put in the tube, they are sent for testing. So each embryo undergoes this embryo biopsy. And then after the tubing, the embryos are frozen separately. So the result of the testing, like when we send these five to 10 cells to an embryology lab to test the cells, the method on which the cells are tested is called as NGS or next generation sequencing. We need to understand that even genetics has undergone a remarkable change over a period of time. In the past one or two decades, the genetics or the procedures that are involved for testing the cells has undergone remarkable innovation, has progressed and we have more authentic, more informative results nowadays with genetic testing. It started off with a test called as FISH about 15 years ago. F FISH is nothing but fluorescent in situ hybridization. Now this was a genetic test wherein five chromosomes used to be tested in the cells to know if those chromosomes are normal and plan for transfer used to be taken up. But however, we all now know that, you know, it's 23 pairs of chromosomes and testing all the chromosomes is extremely important for us to have good result. So after FISH came the test called as CGH or Comparative Genomic Hybridization and also SNP arrays. Now these two tests also helped in testing the 
embryo for the genetic information but however there was some uh, disadvantage for the fact that sometimes the result would take longer at the same time those cgs gave us reports within 2 days that was not completely informative so the test that we use now is called as next generation sequencing or ngs ngs among all the test is the best at present to know the information about the cells and with ngs the reports can vary which we'll discuss later so once we get these reports wherein we come to know whether the embryo is normal or abnormal this typically may take about 2 to 3 weeks time then the decision is taken which embryos to transfer so there are several kinds of reports that can come in the report can be euploid euploid means the test tells that the embryo has exact number of chromosomes which are required for a successful outcome with respect to the baby now when i say euploid embryo that means the embryo has 23 pairs of chromosomes which are rightly situated and are correct according to the regular arrangement the other report that we can get is called as aneuploid now aneuploid means having one chromosome more or one chromosome less So in the 23 set of chromosomes if suppose a chromosome is missing that's called as monosomy it's one of kinds of aneuploidy if one chromosome is more it's called as a trisomy so if we have extra chromosomes or less chromosomes those kind of embryos are not viable and will not result in a pregnancy in fact they can vary from lack of implantation to a miscarriage or a biochemical pregnancy and so on and so forth so aneuploid embryos definitely should not be transferred the third kind of report that we may get with pgta is called as a mosaic embryo now what is mosaicism mosaicism is a condition wherein if you have more than one or two cell lines within those 5 to 10 cells that you have taken for biopsy then it is called as mosaic embryo now usually mosaicism is again reported as either low level mosaicism or high level mosaicism so if it is a low level of mosaicism that is very limited cell lines are seen usually less than 25% or so after thorough genetic counseling we can still consider it for transfer but however we need to keep in mind that once the pregnancy happens there should be additional testing on the baby to make sure that the concept is normal the third kind of report that we may get post a pgta testing is either inconclusive or inadequate dna or chaotic embryo now chaotic embryo is wherein there is too much of noise and they are not able to interpret the report correctly by an ngs now usually chaotic embryo you can decide to redo the testing or you can decide to discard the embryo if there is insufficient dna which can happen sometimes due to apoptotic cells or if the number of cells that we biopsied were lesser these kind of reports in such situation though it is not a very common occurrence but if in case it happens in these kind of reports one may take a decision to biopsy the embryo again but however we have to keep in mind that if we do a re biopsy the chances of implantation even if it's a normal euploid embryo can be lesser there is a potential to harm the embryo further interpreting a pgta result is also to be considered carefully there are several kinds of reports that you may get or results that you may get out of pgta the first is euploid euploid means that the embryo is normal has a normal set of chromosomes normal number of chromosomes and they are arranged well the euploid embryo is the most preferred embryo for transfer and that is what we need to aim for when we do a pgta the second report is called aneuploid so it the embryo may be reported as aneuploid when you say aneuploid embryo that means there is one chromosome extra or one chromosome less in any of the positions from position 1 to chromosome number 22 or in the sex chromosomes so if you have abnormal number of chromosomes such embryos should not be transferred and should be discarded the third kind of report that may come in is called as mosaic embryo mosaic embryo is wherein there are multiple cell lines so as i said we take about 5 to 10 cells for testing and in these 5 to 10 cells if there are multiple cell lines that is one cell shows abnormality the other cell is normal and another cell shows abnormality that is called as mosaicism now in these kind of mosaicisms action will depend on how much is the degree of mosaicism so there is something called as low level mosaicism and then there is high level mosaicism usually 20 to 40% mosaic embryos are considered as low level mosaic and above 40 or 50% is considered as high level mosaic low level mosaic embryos can still be considered for transfer because there are enough reports which have been published that with low level mosaicism having a healthy baby at term now why this happens this is because embryos are known to undergo auto correction if there are cell lines which are abnormal so many times the embryo may discard those cells and allow only the normal cells to grow and eventually the embryo may correct itself to become normal so low level mosaic embryos also can be considered for transfer provided you don't have any euploid embryos so if there are euploid embryos that would be the first choice for transfer 
the next or if there are no other embryos or only low level mosaicism embryos are available then they also can be chosen for transfer but one has to keep in mind that a thorough genetic counseling has to happen prior to transferring low level mosaic embryos and in the event that a pregnancy ensues the doctor may also consider testing further because we also can do prenatal testing that is in pregnancy also we can test the baby has to whether it's normal or not prior to 12 weeks or 15 weeks and so on and so forth so low level mosaicism can be transferred but with additional counseling and the intention that in pregnancy we are going to check again the other report that we may get is a chaotic embryo now chaotic embryo is one is a result which is given by the genetic lab when there are multiple abnormalities and multiple cells showing different kinds of abnormalities like too many trisomies or multiple monosomies and things like that a chaotic embryo definitely should not be considered for transfer the last but not very infrequent is no result or inconclusive result no result or inconclusive result is basically because there are times when the embryo is a b grade embryo or a c grade embryo especially with respect to the trophectoderm and when you take typically 6 to 10 cells there is a possibility that the cell already is on its way to apoptosis that is destruction if it's an abnormal cell and in that situation you may not get a result out of the testing now if it is an inconclusive result or no result the options in front of us are one to rebiopsy and then figure out what to do with the embryo or rather do repeat an ivf have more embryos and then redo the testing and whenever we re biopsy the embryo that is once a embryo biopsy is done and you want to consider biopsying the embryo again we need to keep in mind that attempting biopsy again and again can result in reducing the implantation potential of the embryo so basically even if you get a euploid result at the end of a second biopsy the implantation potential of the embryo can be lesser when compared to a test that was done primarily coming to what are the advantages of pgta why should one consider pgta see we all know and we know beyond doubt that maternal age is a very important criteria or very important uh, contributor to abnormalities in the embryo so has the maternal age is higher which means if the lady is above 30 about 35 about 40 progressively we see there is higher risk of infertility higher risk of chemical pregnancies higher risk of miscarriage this happens because of a condition called as aneuploid oocytes basically aneuploidy as i told you is uh, abnormality in the number of chromosomes and aneuploidy is more and more common with respect to maternal age so if we do a pgta so in women about 38 if we are planning for a pgta then the age of effect on the outcome of ivf can be mitigated so pgta helps us identify which embryo is normal and hence it will help us make sure that our pregnancy rate will be similar to a young person one of the indications for pgta is an elderly lady so if the age of the lady is about 35 PGTA is a good test for the couple to consider prior to undergoing a transfer. Now the other advantage of doing a PGTA is that it can also reduce time to pregnancy, which means that suppose you have about eight to ten embryos, doing a PGTA will help you identify which ones are normal, and selecting those embryos for transfer will indirectly help you reducing the time to pregnancy because if you're not done a PGTA, you would be going on transferring one after the other, and you eventually do not know at which stage you're going to reach a pregnancy. That's one of the important advantages of doing a PGTA. PGT also will help in reducing multiple births or rather twin pregnancy. This is basically because whenever you do a PGT and you found the embryo is normal, you would always prefer to transfer one embryo at a time that way you also avoid the risk of having a twin pregnancy. See for want of increasing the chances of pregnancy usually for untested embryos clinicians doctors and also patients tend to transfer more embryos but if you have done a pgt and know that if the embryo is normal you can stick to transferring only one embryo at a time because it definitely enhances your chances of conception more than untested embryos one other advantage of pgt is that the miscarriage rate is also lower basically because the embryo is normal however it's not zero we need to understand that in spite of knowing that the embryo is normal miscarriages can still happen because for successful outcome of a pregnancy it's also uterine involvement and for a pregnancy to continue smoothly it's not only the embryo but also the uterus but in pgta you are making making sure that the embryo aspect is more controlled and normal So let's understand what are the limitations of PGTA. The main limitation of PGTA is the fact that it's not 100% accurate. So even after doing the PGTA finding that the embryo was normal, there is a small risk maybe to the tune of 2% or so that the embryo may still be abnormal. So basically we need to understand that we are taking cells from the trophectoderm and from not the cells that form the baby. 
so there could be a possibility that there are abnormal cells within the inner cell mass but though this is rare pgta also has a potential of embryo damage see embryo biopsy is an extremely technically challenging and also skillful procedure so taking only 5 to 6 cells out of the whole embryo there can be problems during biopsy which can lead to damage to the the third important factor is that PGTA positively needs us to freeze the embryo. Take the cells and send it for testing. It takes minimum two to three weeks for us to have definite results of the genetic testing. So meanwhile, while we are waiting, we need to freeze the embryo and then plan for transfer. The other factor is the costing. Because it is a more extremely advanced test, the expenses of the cycle and the complexity around the procedures is much, much higher. So it's very, very important to choose the right lab for PGTA, somebody who's had experience with it, and also reach out to the right genetic lab to have correct reports which help us having a good outcome.